Hi everyone and welcome to Learn A-Level Biology for free with Miss Estrick. In this video, we'll be going through generating an action potential as part of the nervous system topic. So first of all, what is an action potential? So this is when the neuron's voltage, and in particular we're focusing on the axon in the neuron, increases beyond the resting potential, which is minus 70 millivolts. And that will then generate an action potential, or in other words, a nervous impulse. So an increased voltage above the resting potential is called depolarization. And this is when the voltage starts to become more positive. And that is caused by the axon membrane becoming more permeable to sodium ions. And therefore more sodium ions are going to move into the axon and increase the positive charge. So once the action potential is generated at one position, that will then cause the action potential to be generated at the next node of Rambia, and the next, and the next, and so on. So it's like a Mexican wave action. So let's go through exactly what is happening then when this action potential is generated. So we'll start with just by looking at the resting potential here. Now this is in a lot more detail in one of the previous videos, which I'll just link at the top so you can click here to review that content. So the resting potential we said is minus 70 millivolts inside of the axon. And that is maintained by a sodium potassium pump, which I haven't actually got shown here, and the potassium ion channels, we have more of them and some of them are permanently open like this one, whereas this one's closed and we've got voltage gated sodium ion channels, which are closed. So we have potassium ions diffusing out, maintaining this minus 70 millivolts um, voltage. Now, when you do have a stimulus, so a change in the environment, that provides enough energy so that it can cause these voltage gated sodium ion channels in the axon membrane to open and as a result we will now have sodium ions diffusing into the axon at the same time as the potassium ions diffusing out so we start to get this slight increase in voltage now if you get above minus 55 millivolts that is the threshold that will then provide even more energy to enable more of these voltage gated sodium ion ch channels to open. So as a result, we have even more sodium ions diffusing in and we have the same quantity of potassium ions diffusing out. So we get this sharp increase in voltage or depolarization. Now it will always peak at plus 40 millivolts. It can't get any higher than plus 40 millivolts. The reason for that is these voltage gated sodium ion channels will actually close when 40 millivolts is reached inside the axon. So that will then mean that you've reached your peak, it's not going to increase any further. And that's then the first start, first part of repolarization. So we then have potassium ion channels are opened at that particular voltage. So we end up with two channels open, so we have twice the amount of potassium ions now diffusing out, which causes this decrease in voltage. So it starts to become more negative again, because comparatively, we now have more positive ions outside compared to inside. Now this continues to happen to the point where you get this overshoot beyond the resting potential and we call this the refractory period where temporarily you go below resting minus 70 and you reach about minus 80 millivolts. That's often called hyperpolarization um, or we've got overshoot or refractory period. So the key things that you need to be aware of are the names of the different stages, what causes it, so the different protein channels within the axon membrane opening and closing. As well as that, there's two key concepts. The first one is the um, Mexican wave analogy that we said at the start. So now we've gone through this action potential graph, it's just to make you aware that this graph is not looking at a change over distance along the axon, it's a change over time. So at this exact point on the axon, in the space of about 
four or three milliseconds, that part of the axon will go through all of those voltage changes. And when you reach that plus 40 millivolts, that's enough to trigger the next part of the axon to start its depolarization wave and so on and so on. That will keep happening at all of the nodes of Rambia until we get right to the end and then it will be passed on to the next neuron. So this movement of action potential, these are discrete events that happen all the way along like a Mexican wave. The all or nothing principle is another concept that you need to be familiar with. And this links to the threshold potential that I mentioned. So minus 55 millivolts is the threshold. And what we mean by that is if the stimulus is not large enough, it won't provide enough energy to open enough sodium ion channels to go above minus 55. So if that's the case, you will not get an action potential. And that's the nothing part of all or nothing. So the all part is the fact that if you do reach minus 55, you will always have an action potential, but all of them will peak at the same level, plus 40 millivolts. And that's because as soon as you get to that voltage, it causes the sodium ion channels to shut, and then we go into repolarization. So instead, the bigger the stimuli, you don't get a larger peak, you get a higher frequency of action potentials. So those action potentials will be firing more quickly along the axon. So that's what we mean by the all or nothing principle. If you reach that threshold, you'll always have a response. If you don't, there'll be nothing, but it always peaks at the same amplitude, plus 40 millivolts. Larger stimuli, which could mean a brighter light or a louder sound, so bigger change in your environment, just means a higher frequency of action potential. So the reason this is important is it makes sure that animals are only responding to large enough stimuli rather than responding to every single slight change in your environment as this would completely overwhelm your senses and actually hinder survival rather than help survival. So the last part that you need to know is the refractory period. Now we mentioned this on the diagram earlier where you have that hyperpolarization. So this is where after the action potential has been generated, the membrane enters that refractory period, the minus 80 millivolts. And that's where it can't be stimulated for another action potential yet. The reason is the sodium channels are recovering and can't be opened. So the refractory period is really important for three reasons. Number one, it's to ensure that discrete impulses are produced. What we mean by that is you don't have any overlaps. So you can't have an action potential being generated immediately after another one. And that's to make sure each action potential is separate from another. So you're able to process that information in more detail and identify exactly what the stimulus was and where it came from. It also ensures that the action potential can only travel forwards in one direction. Now that is really important because if that stimulus um, and the action potential wasn't traveling in one direction, you would end up having the spreading out of those sodium potassium ions in two directions. So go forwards and backwards along the axon. And if that happened, it would prevent reaching the threshold potential and it would prevent you ever being able to respond to a stimulus. So the last one is it limits the number of impulse transmission. What we mean by that is it limits the number of action potentials that can happen in a set amount of time. And that's really important because it prevents overreaction to a stimulus, which again, just like with the all or nothing principle, could result in overwhelming the senses, which would hinder your survival rather than enhance it. So that's it for the action potentials. If you have found this helpful today, please give it a thumbs up and make sure you click the subscribe button to keep up to date with all the latest videos.